Good morning. Welcome to our um, new Grand Rounds format, to our Distinguished Visiting Lecturer Grand Rounds. We're kicking it off today, and um, I'm delighted to say we have an extremely um, interesting presentation, an exciting topic, and a couple of great presenters. Um, the Distinguished Visiting Lecture Grand Rounds are a new series we're starting. These are Grand Rounds that we're going to hold on the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, we're going to um, always invite an outside speaker, uh, to someone who's uh, particularly distinguished in their, particular, in their area. And we're going to um, really focus on both spreading the word among members of our community and colleagues and friends that come to these Grand Rounds and having uh, time afterwards for questions, answers, and stimulating discussion with our visiting lecturers. Um, and so today, to kick it off, um, it gives me a, a really great pleasure to introduce, um, we, we're going to have two co-speakers. We're going to have um, uh, Linda Demeff, who is President and Chief Scientific Officer of the Evidence-Based Practice Institute, and Kelly Kerner, who's the Creative Director and the uh, CEO of the Evidence-Based Practice Institute. Um, and uh, these are two uh, very talented um, people who are clinicians, thought leaders, um, scientists, and I would say creative visionaries in terms of where we can go moving forward in terms of being able to offer um, evidence-based psychotherapy treatments in a manner that is scalable, affordable, and accessible um, for patients no matter where, the, where they are located or no matter what resources are available to them. Um, as part of their work with the uh, Evidence-Based Practices Institute, but also um, their work thinking kind of more broadly about the issues of how do we leverage digital technology, um, uh, both Kelly and Linda have um, been very creative in thinking about what are the research questions that need to be asked, what are the technologies that need to be developed, how do you think about user interfaces so that as we acquire information that will help guide treatment, um, clinicians can make use of it, but also ultimately patients and family members can make use of it, that the information gets fed back um, to really the person who should be the, the person who's deciding how their treatment goes and which direction their treatment goes. Um, I can say personally that um, we've only known each other um, really over the last few months as we've had some phone conversations, some conference calls, and now meeting each other uh, in person last night over dinner and talking this morning. But um, these are two now, I think, soon going to become close colleagues where we think very similarly um, that we're at the threshold of a new age where, where science and evidence um, can marry with um, uh, interactive technology uh, so that, you know, the dream of being able to office, offer the best possible treatments to the widest number of patients doesn't have to stay a dream. We can actually start translating it into real tools. Um, so Kelly and Linda are going to talk to you about having a big old impact. Um, and I will turn it over to, I think, uh, Kelly's going to start. Yeah, okay. Good morning. What a pleasure. We came, we're from Seattle, and we came out here thinking, uh, it was actually somebody advised we bring our snow boots. So we were expecting <laughs> like feet of snow, and uh, it's been surprisingly warm here. And uh, amazingly friendly. It's uh, from arriving in the airport to everything we've had so far, it just feels like uh, second home, practically, and I don't. I mean, I I don't feel like from from the Midwest. You know, and I don't think of that. But it's um, it's really a genuine pleasure for, to be here with you guys. So uh, we're both clinical psychologists by training, trained as research scientists, um, very actively involved in training and figuring out how to get the best evidence based practices out there. So we started as sort of trainers, like how do you bring a system of people along to doing an evidence-based practice? And as we evolved in trying that, we found that you couldn't scale it. You know, you go and you do one training, but then those people graduate or those people go to a different job, and then you've lost all of the training that you just did. And the system has lost all of that competence. And so how do, you, how do you actually train in a way that's sustainable? 
that keeps an evidence-based practice available to the, the patients there. And that led us into looking at technology. And so we came sort of prepared to talk to you about what we think are innovative um, ideas that are happening in the field. And we came ready to pivot based on what you guys' interests were. So it'd be very helpful, actually, to hear, you know, sort of just get you guys in our minds. So for a second, who all is actually works here at the U of M? Just a quick show of hands. OK. And anybody from the community, just to see? OK. So a handful of folks there. And then how many of you are trainees? Is there, are there any trainees? OK. Fantastic. And then how many of you have um, direct teaching responsibilities? OK, so fair number. OK, great. And then um, how many have direct patient care? OK, nearly everyone. OK, that's very helpful. And um, how many of you would, would say that you have to deliver some version of a behavioral health intervention? Just to see. OK. OK, that is fantastic. You're, OK, you're who I thought we were going to. Sometimes you show up, and it's a very different audience, but you're who we thought. <laughs> And so uh, it's not we, quantum physics. It's not. No. <laughs> it's the next talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, I have a little thing on a on a astrophysicist at the end. To be honest, so we will we'll have a little. Well, okay. All right. <laughs> Um, but I guess what we came, what we came, we thought what would be most interesting to you is how do you train in evidence-based practices, and how do you learn them, and how do you keep up, and um, and how do you deliver them, and how do you do it collaboratively, and and that sort of thing. So we've focused on work that we've done and that colleagues are doing. There's a lot that is happening, so we had to call out some things, but we're. Available for, we save time for questions and answers. And then there's a very nice gathering area. For those of you who haven't been here before, there's a nice gathering area just outside. And we're going to stick around, you know, to continue the conversation. So if we didn't get to some area that you really are interested in, um, like, for example, machine learning is not so much in this talk, but it's something I'm really interested in. If there's some topics that are very interesting to you, you can nab us afterward, and we're happy to keep going. So uh, I, I would just say quickly that the goals, the things that we think we will cover, I've planned to cover. Let's see if this, hmm. I'll give you this in case you can sort. And then let me see if I can move this along. Ah. Oh, let's just see. Oh, uh, great. You did it. Did I do that? You, you did. Oh, wait. Do you want to do our conflicts of interest? Yeah, so I would just say, as a conflict of interest, we, we do co-own a business. And so we are, we're trained as academics, but we move to the private sector because it lets us be able to pursue our social mission more successfully, in some ways, more freely, uh, and without the sort of uh, back and forths of pursuing grant funding. So we're a social mission company, social entrepreneurs, but in a for-profit business. We need to disclose that. And, um, and that we uh, will see um, royalties from books that we've authored. So that would be our conflicts of interest. And then just to say a little, what we're hoping to be able to show you quickly is some on e-learning, uh, learning communities, computerized cognitive behavioral therapy, um, and self-help, so uh, a way in which you can deliver self-help interventions at a very high level. Um, some about some of the neat stuff that's coming out around mobile technology. Um, we may get to talk a little bit about wearables. We'll see if we can squeeze that in. And, uh, and then sort of the way in which Willow, a product that we've been developing with the help of the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, has sort of is the culmination of many different lines of research that we've both pursued and the ways that very big data can be used to actually inform our care and guide clinical decisions. So that's what we hope will get done in this next stretch of time. Linda will talk for about 40, 45 minutes, somewhere in there. And then uh, I'll bring us home and make sure that we bring you know, us home. Yeah. <laughs> Wave us out. So Linda, do you want to? Sure. OK, great. All right. So um, hello, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here. And thank you for such a lovely um, introduction. So, you know, you all know this, but just so that we keep it in the forefront of our minds, but I have to say it's staggering to me every time I see that number of 50 million people in the U.S. alone, right? We're not talking worldwide. We're just saying in our little country here of the U.S. Um, suffer from mental illness of one sort or another. This number actually goes fairly, it goes higher if you, act, if you add in alcohol and drug abuse. Um, 
And they, there are totally um, effective treatments to help them solve their problems. But the reality is, currently, one in seven will receive a treatment that works for the problem that they have. Um, so when I think about this being my daughter, my uh, nephew, uh, my best friend, um, my patients, it's mortifying to think um, that that is our reality. This is nothing new, right? So this, this what used to be called the dissemination gap um, is something that, that very smart people and our federal government have been trying to solve for the last, what, 20 years? And at least 20 years. You know, that despite the fact that we have these like awesome mental health evidence-based protocols that we know work for most problems that um, the majority of people who make up that 50 million have. Um, we have these carefully constructed research protocols, and treatment manuals, but the facts are those treatments don't show up for lots of reasons, right? Like maybe it's because of how we've constructed them for those of you who work in real world settings. Um, you know, outside of the construct of a research environment, you know, you have the real world um, environment of insurance that you're contending with or structures that don't make it possible for you to deliver an evidence-based treatment. But then there's other things, right? Like the fact that um, even when you know it evidence-based treatment, clinicians drift, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not. But the point is there's a ton of reasons why this um, remains, despite billions of dollars going into solving this problem, a major problem. Um, now, it is even harder, if I walk around, I don't know how annoying this is going to be, but it's even harder for those of you who work with multi-diagnostic people with borderline personality disorder. How many of you actually do work with BPD? So actually, a number of you in this room, um, and certainly that was the group of people that Kelly and I um, kind of cut our clinical teeth on at the University of Washington working with Marsha. There, um, just if we could go back for a moment to dsm 4 when we had the multi-axle system, um, three to four people who have borderline personality disorder also had access, they, not three to four people, people with BPD had three to four axis one problems and two to three axis two problems. So the implication for the clinician is not only having to learn DBT, which is, by the way, hard enough, right, or another evidence-based treatment like mineralization for BPD, but then you also have to know how to treat all of these other problems. So it becomes really a complex um, conundrum, and yet the stakes are really high. Um, so we had the thought, largely, to be perfectly honest, Kelly had the thought, is there some way that we could leverage technology? Now, um, this is actually sort of amazing if you think about this, right? The internet as we know it is only just barely over 10,000 days old. Um, and think about how it's transformed your life. Now, I had a real-world moment <laughs> with this when my partner decided to um, have us for the, for the winter holidays go to a cabin resort. Now, I also direct and own a clinic in Portland, Oregon, with 30 clinicians serving all of them borderline personality disorder patients. So it's actually important for me to know if I have cell phone reception, right? Um, not to mention my internet connection. So I'm assured that, in fact, we do. But the facts are, there's no internet and there's no phone <laughs> at this little awesome cabin that we're at, which means, for my dear daughter, there's no Instagram, so she can't communicate with uh, Kelly's daughter, Claire, and they've grown up together. Um, nor is there Netflix, nor is there my Google Calendar, nor is there my Trello board for all of the tasks, my work tasks, that even though I'm on vacation, I'm, you know how it is. Uh, you know, so, I mean, this is the thing. Um, now, check this out. Um, and what's so interesting, and I just want to say this, these stats, these stats change like this moment, right? Everything Kelly and I will be talking about with technology will be out of date, honestly, in the next month, okay? Because of how quickly technology is moving. And just as a note, if you're a researcher trying to do research in this area, it's almost impossible because everything is moving so quickly. Not really almost impossible, but check this out. This is every single second what's happening. Every single second. Google is having 58,000 searches a second, right? So then I was trying to figure out how to quantify that. So if you think um, it's, it's basically 41.6 terabytes per second, which is of, of web traffic worldwide. So that's like the equivalent of four 
uh, libraries of Congress, right? Like everything that's in the Library of Congress four times um, in one second. All right, so now here's, here's, um, here's sort of where Kelly and I, our, our origins began. So in the early days when we were trying to teach uh, DBT um, to everyone else, um, we had this intensive training model. So just for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Linehan created this brilliant idea of two parts of a training each five days. Five days for part one, you learn the treatment. You go home, you have a ton of homework, and then you come back for part two, where you're then asked to present a case and your program, and you get lots of feedback. There's a ton that you have to do between part one and part two. So Kelly had the idea, is it possible that somehow we could speed up training um, and improve outcomes if we actually did, at the time, what was called programmed learning. To be perfectly honest, I didn't even know what programmed learning was. But, um, but this is really where we began. Now, there are a ton of benefits for those of you familiar with training. You know, here's listed several, but the, the reality is this. As learners, you know, we each have very unique ways that we learn and we process information, right? And some people are more visual learners, some people are more auditory learners. Um, and our thought too, and you know, you come to an audience like this, um, and not like this, but you know, a workshop. And if you just do standard regular old training, what happens is that, well, actually we don't know what happens, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Your body's here, but is your mind here, right? The beautiful thing with online training is that you can actually tailor the curriculum. You can add exercises that really meet the needs of each individual learner's style, right? They can go at it their own pace, um, and you can also build in these things like um, quizzes that allow us to see, did you actually master the content before you go on? So there's a lot of benefit of online training. Um, and not to mention the fact that um, if you're not having to travel, then it's carbon neutral. Um, all right, so the thing is, we did a ton of um, research, Kelly and I, over the course of our careers, really looking at, does online training work for clinicians learning DBT? And here's what we know, and by the way, this is super consistent with the research literature that's out there. This is from three of our trials. Um, yes, it improves knowledge, self-efficacy, meaning people feel more confident about their ability to actually do the thing. Um, they oftentimes prefer this mode over other modes, particularly reading a treatment manual in a room by themselves. Um, and it's a lot less expensive than to attend workshops. But now there's a problem, <laughs> and it's kind of a big problem. And the problem is that it doesn't actually change clinical performance. Now, just to let you know, we had the most rigorous ways that we would test clinical performance. We would... Um, I mean, this is just a little, a little um, funny little fact, but we, are, we would train up our assistants to act like they had borderline person, our research assistants to act like they had borderline personality disorder. So this is in the days of BTEC. And there was kind of the one organization that was kind of driving the business operation. And then there was the research group. And what you would hear in the, you know, the back sort of um, offices of the research group was people yelling and screaming and acting like people with borderline personality disorder because they were doing simulated role plays where, um, as part of these performance-based clinical trials to see pre-post um, could a clinician, after going through, I must say, our fabulous online trainings that actually were award-winning, did it actually you know, make a difference? So it was really a hoot. Um, but the facts were, it didn't actually change their capacity. Um, so, okay, how about more supervision? More cowbells, please, Kelly Kerner. This is her slide. Okay, I have to say, I did not know what a cowbell was yesterday. And the moment I found out about it, I could barely stop laughing when I saw the Saturday night... Um, Anyway, I'll keep going because I don't even know what it was. Um, all right, so what we thought was, can we, um, can we add learning communities to this whole equation? Can we get expert people to help facilitate actually people going through and learning what's in our awesome online trainings? So Kelly had already developed Practice Ground. Um, and Practice Ground was um, a super innovative platform, it continues on, that combines synchronous, meaning real-time live workshops, um, with asynchronous um, activities as well. 
And it was really provided people an opportunity to dive deep into an area of content and then to talk amongst themselves. Now, I was super, and it applied the principles um, of deliberate practice, where people were constantly practicing these things that they were learning. So intrigued by that, we thought, OK, well, let's go ahead and see if we can apply a similar model um, in our randomized controlled trials to see if, in fact, if we use our online trainings, we combine it with a learning community, right? We do all of these functions, which, you know, if you're interested, we can go through the details. But one of the things that we really wanted to make sure is that, A, the person was actually learning and using the online training, right? They were doing it and completing it. And um, B, they were actually having a chance to role play and practice. We figured that would make a difference. Um, and in fact, the results from three randomized control trials is that, in fact, while they liked it, it did not change clinical performance. All right, fast forward. Finally, Melanie Harnett and I came up with another model that was case-based. Everyone was required to have a client that they were directly applying the topic to. It was an expert that facilitated each of these calls. And then finally, using that same, what we call performance-based role play model, we found that, in fact, that did change positively clinical performance. OK, but here's the thing. <laughs> you know, we then started thinking about, um, is this really working to solve this problem, this level? Because here's why. Um, can you scale, really, supervision at that level and online training at that level? And we're pretty sure. Um, that it's not possible for the following reasons. Now, check this out. Um, this is for online training. It's not, uh, or for um, instructor-led training, and then you'll see the supervision costs here in a moment. Don't get too caught up in the details, but if you just accept for the moment that when someone's engaged in training, there's a loss of productivity based on who you are and the service that you provide. It's probably between um, several hundred bucks and a thousand dollars, but let's just say on average 400. Um, then you have the cost of registration and travel. Then you have supervision costs. This is based on not a ton of supervision, right? This is assuming only 10 sessions of supervision with a relatively cheap supervisor who happens to be an expert who's available, by the way. If you add it all together, you know, you'll just have to check that I, you know, trust that I did the math correct. But just the first two, um, $60,000, this is for a two-day training, add um, $75,000 for supervision to make sure that you actually don't do harm, because there's a bunch of data that shows that, in fact, sometimes you can do harm by only doing two days of training, um, that people actually get a little cocky. They think they know more than they actually do, and so much so that they don't actually pursue other training. So. Now you're at $135,000, but let's, that's only for one EST, right? Let's say that, in fact, you, know, you and your clinic need to know more than just treating depression. You also have to know how to treat anxiety and insomnia, right? So now you're at almost a half a million dollars, 405, to train 50 staff for three two-day trainings. Um, but there's more, all right? And can one person actually be an expert? I mean, think about it. So, we were consulting with one of our colleagues at Group Health um, Collaborative or um, Group Health Cooperative in uh, Seattle, which is like a big um, kind of HMO, and and he was saying to us, and he's a guy who directs the the behavioral services there, and he said, you know, Linda Kelly, there's only so many evidence-based treatments that people can know at one time, and I started thinking about that myself. It's like, you know, it's really true, and so what do we do as clinicians when we don't know those other evidence-based treatments? I mean, I don't know what you do, but as someone who's a clinician and a supervisor, what we end up doing is simply not assessing problems that we don't know how to treat. You know, we just sort of turn a our eye to the OCD because I've actually never treated OCD, even though the patient came in and said, you know, some people think I actually have OCD. Um, so there's, there's that, there's that reality. And if you think about the number of evidence-based treatments, which are probably at this point thousands, right? Um, how do you actually become a specialist in that many? Treatment that works series by David Barlow. There's literally 50 or more treatment manuals that are available in that Oxford series alone. So there's that problem. But then there's also this other problem. We went to a recently a lecture by um, the chair of um, uh, psychiatry at the University of Washington, and he was talking about silos of excellence. 
Um, but you know, the facts are both in our institutions and for whatever reason, <laughs> you know, we have the National Institute of Drug Abuse, National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, National Institute of Mental Health. But the facts are many of our multi-diagnostic patients are not, they're just one person. So what do you do? when your person actually has mental health problems and they also have alcohol and drug problems and they also have other problems like intimate partner violence. So it becomes kind of a complicated thing. So we began just wondering and musing, are we going fast enough? You know, are we even thinking big enough? Is there some other more innovative way to go? And what if we bring the expert to the person in terms of self-help? So let's just, um, let me orient you here quickly, because this has had a huge impact on um, not only our thinking and our research over the years, but also the directions that we're heading um, that I feel super excited about um, heading as we go forward with Willow, which Kelly will tell you about. But you know, if you think about this from a public health step care approach, is it possible that we could do sort of lower intensity interventions that are also lower cost um, for the people who don't have super severe problems and really keep our dollars and our own intensity for the more complex problems. Um, and we might start with kind of a step care approach. This is particularly important in the area of integrated um, uh, primary care where you, know, you want to figure out, can you reach the most people just doing self-help, doing something simple, and then again, keeping your dollars um, for um, the more challenging clients um, who are specialists. So um, I am going to walk through. Well, so, so just to say pure self-help. Yeah, okay, well, pure self-help is literally where it's just self-help. There's nothing else. I give you an app, you do it, or you just go to your own app. You do it yourself, and you know it has whatever effect it has on you. Guided self-help, um, and I'll talk to you about the research literature here in a moment, but is essentially where um, I give you the same tool, but I wrap around the tool um, um, guidance, support, motivation, um, a structure that helps you actually um, end up doing that thing. So we were talking earlier earlier today with Sophia about, you know, it's interesting, you're, even if, if you have a gym membership versus if you have a personal trainer, are you more likely to have a regular schedule at the gym if you just have a gym membership or if you have an appointment with a personal trainer? Most of us having that structure around us, it will increase the odds. So that's guided self-help. Same tool, but guided and packaged with a little bit of assistance. A CCBT, computerized cognitive behavioral therapy, um, enhanced therapy means where you might give, you're still doing your face-to-face -face treatment, but it may be augmented um, with computers. Um, that may aid the client in learning this or that. They're doing it outside you know, the session with you, without you. And then facilitated, and I'll show you some examples of this, is where it's actually guiding you through, um, in real time, the treatment, you and the patient. It's actually helping um, guide you through an evidence-based treatment. So let me, I'll give you examples of what this looks like. So we actually, one of our very first projects, this was, um, this was uh, Kelly and Jennifer Waltz's brainchild years ago, and probably a number of you who are DBT practitioners um, uh, either helped us uh, evaluate this or have used it in your own work. But we were wondering, you know, to this whole thing of is there a way where you can transport the treatment developer into, you know, the living room, literally, of a patient with borderline personality disorder? and actually teach them a skill. Like, you know, that, is that something that, that you could actually do? At the, t at the time, this is now years ago, there had been no self-help in the area of borderline. There had been self-help in the area of smoking cessation, but not in borderline. So in fact, um, results from our well-controlled um, within subjects design of 30 people who were not actually receiving DBT at all, pre-post, um, not only did they um, benefit from learning it, um, they had positive outcome expectancies um, about using the skill of opposite action, meaning that if they used it, they expected something positive to happen. 
And um, Linehan, in this video, um, at, at the time it was a video, um, she tells them at the very end, now here's what I want you to do. She says this is part of the thing. I want you to go out and do X, Y, and Z. Well, so actually 80% of them did X, Y, and Z, which is sort of shocking, right? Um, and, and what they also um, reported was a significant decrease in their negative affect upon using the skill. So that was pretty shocking. Now, I just want to say one other, um, this is related and not related, but you know, one of the really important things in the field um, of technology is user-centered design, right? Like actually making sure that when you're designing software, you're getting tons of feedback by your target end users. You're finding out what they like and what they don't like. Um, and you're making sure that um, they can use it easily and they love it. You know, before you're too far down the pike, I mean, you want to, anyway, there's a whole science which, you know, we could talk about. But one of the interesting findings from the study, actually, when I think about the takeaways for me, one thing that the, pa the patients with borderline personality disorder said was, um, we actually, we want Linehan talking directly to us. We had, remember, we had had the original thought, we would film this of her teaching a skills training class. We showed them illustrations of that, and they said, we hate it, because I'm not there. I want to be with you. You know, so we said, all right, scratch that. <laughs> We're going to do a different approach. We're going to have Linehan talking directly to you. So that really was very powerful in terms of sort of cementing in our own minds this notion of can you transport the person directly into the room where the expert talks to the patient, right, um, directly. Um, all right, so computerized um, CBT. Now, in the U are you all familiar with computerized CBT? All right, so computerized CBT is something that in um, other parts of the developed planet um, where they have um, health care that's paid for by the government, this is really, really, really important. Now, I say this only because as we move to, we don't know what's going to happen with the Trump administration, but probably in terms of the Affordable Care Act, but, but I feel pretty sure that what's going to happen is that we're going to continue to move to value-based care and away from fee-for-service care. And that has huge implications, huge implications for all of us in this room. And here's why. I was sharing um, earlier today, We were there's an interesting article that just got published in JAMA in January or December. It was the last issue in December of JAMA by Rahm Emanuel's brother. And what that it tells you about healthcare costs in the US, it turns out that healthcare costs in the United States are health, the budget connected to healthcare in the US, it is the fifth largest budget in the planet, you know, so in terms of, uh, and it's gonna become the fourth. So just our healthcare budget, does this make sense? Compared to, you know, a bunch of other countries, we're like number five, just what we spend on healthcare. And the costs, if you take chronic illness, and then you, you take a person who has chronic illness and who is not depressed, the cost, and then you take a person who is depressed with that same chronic illness, if they're depressed, they're going to cost, check this out, $520 more per month than the patient who is not depressed. Are you tracking me here? So now suddenly the incentive is going to tilt from don't treat mental illness to you got to treat mental illness, all right? So, so this is super important for all of us to know because what these guys essentially did in the UK and Australia and other places is they created, they took their expertise and they said, we're going to create essentially a module, a modularized approach that you're going to do on your own. Um, and to treat your depression, to treat your anxiety with fabulous outcomes, sort of. So, um, and you can see what's awesome about this. I mean, from my perspective, the brilliant thing about this is that computers don't drift, assuming you actually do it, right, the way people do. Um, now, here's just a couple of examples of um, one that was developed by Isaac Marks in the UK and his colleague Stuart um, a tool called Fear Fighter. This is one that actually is um, sponsored by and paid for by, um, by the, the, um, the government um, for anxiety. Now here's, and there's a bunch of others I could, we could talk about, but they all show the same basic thing. So here I just want to ask you what you think will happen. Now, how do you suppose uh, CCBT compares to no treatment at all? Do you think that you're going to have better outcomes or not with CCBT compared to nothing? Okay, those of you who said you're going to have better outcomes, you're right. 
how does it stack up against a treatment as usual? Better or not better or the same? Turns out that it's better. How does it stack up to CCBT? How does CCBT stack up to face-to-face -face treatment? Better, not better, worse. Now, don't you don't even uh, you can just keep your thought private. Here's the um, here's the outcome. This was a meta-analysis study um, done several years ago, um, but the um, data is still the same to date. So, in comparison to weightless controls, it's superior. In comparison to treatment as usual, superior. In comparison to face-to-face, -to -face, exactly the same. Isn't that interesting? Now, guided versus pure, guided is preferred. Now, why? Okay, so um, here, here's the problem that we all have to face, and we were talking about this earlier as well, that um, when you, um, and I've got to get moving here, but the, um, the problem is, CCBT is incredibly effective if you, if you actually get the patient to do it. The problem is getting the patient to do it. So the guided is um, a helpful way of actually making sure that the person receives the treatment. All right, so a couple of other examples. Super innovative work by Peter Royburn and Michelle Krask. Um, he was at uh, U the UW, she's at UCLA, using computers um, in a primary care context, guided by nurses. This is where the treatment itself is being, um, the, the nurse doesn't actually know the treatment, but they're sitting side by side a patient who has anxiety or depression, and they're going through this tool. Coping Cat is an example of one where this was um, developed by Phil um, Kindle and his colleagues at Temple University. Um, and it's where you combine games, computer games, with face-to-face -face treatment and fabulous outcomes. All right, so now just moving quickly to mobile technology. Now think about, I mean, this is like incredible, how mobile technology has revolutionized your life. So BJ Fogg, who's from Stanford, you know, he says, we love our phones. They're always with us. They are like magic wands. Is that not true? Every single one of you, I bet, in this room has a cell phone. Every single one of you, I bet, knows exactly where that cell phone is. And if you couldn't find it, I bet most of you, if not all of you, maybe you have a better Zen practice than me, would get anxious. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, now check this out. This is like, we're just over 10 years um, from this seismic event where Steve Jobs introduces the, this, what he calls um, to the world our new life, lifelong companion, um, the ultimate digital device, only 10 years out. So just check, you can go straight to the bottom. Um, today, there's 2.25 million um, apps in the Apple Store and one 140 billion downloaded. This just shows you um, the exponential increase. Here's the apps, and here's um, the downloads. There's so many. There was a point where we were keeping track of all the mental health apps. It's impossible. You just can't. There's actually now, maybe you guys heard it on NPR, there's something called Universal Prescription. It's an app that is a platform that will help you keep track of all the other apps. You know, will like serve up to you because there's like 268,000 or something like that for healthcare alone. All right, so just super quick, you know, we started experimenting with apps a number of years ago, Shireen Rizvi, Marsha and me, um, seeing if we could create a mobile app um, that people could, um, that would teach them in real time um, a skill and coach them on the use of that skill. So. Um, the bottom line was that, in fact, people loved the app. Um, it worked to decrease emotional intensity. Um, they felt confident in using the skills, and their depression and global distress um, scores um, fell significantly over time. And what was um, also interesting about this, for those of you who do DBT, they said, we prefer the app to calling our therapist. Why? Because we don't actually want to bother our therapist. And this thing is available to me all the time. So, so that was pretty cool. Now, we did, we, um, this has influenced our work. This is a direction we were hoping to go, but NIDA honestly changed their funding directions, and so we weren't able to get it through, even though people were enthusiastic. So we thought, look, so what if, in fact, um, you program in advance? Um, you program in advance on the phone your hotspots. Um, for those, some of you know, I'm a person who's an alcohol and drug abuse um, researcher and clinician as well. So what if we put into the phone hotspots where I'm likely to you know, use drugs? And every time I get close to one of those things, I just get prompted a message. 
um, from my phone. Hey, you might want to use your skills. Or how about when you know my um, someone calls me, my dealer calls me, um, and I really shouldn't be taking that call. And what happens is that you get a a pop-up that says, listen, do you really want to take this call? Check your wise mind, right? Um, <clears throat> now, we're actually, we went to a conference um, where we got to meet um, Scott Hingler, um, who is the treatment developer for um, uh, MST, which is a treatment for antisocial kids and their parents. Um, and he was like, you know what? I need that app. Could we work on that app? So he hooked us up with Cindy Schaefer. We are about to launch um, the phase two of this project. Um, funded, um, God willing, from NIMH. So this just gives you a couple of screen types um, to show you kind of what we were going at. With MST, it turns out, and it's not just MST, one of the most predictive things for positive outcomes for kids who are conduct disorder is does their parent know where they are? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So for those of you with kids you know, who are not yet adults, you know, do you know where your kid is? Like most of you, if not all of you, do know where your kid is. So that actually is predictive of good, positive outcomes for your kid. Um, the problem with kids who are conduct disorder is um, oftentimes they have inconsistent messages for tons of reasons from their parents. Um, and the parent will, um, it's not uncommon, rely more on punishment than positive reinforcement, which we know from the research literature you're better off going positive than punishment. And the parents don't know where the kid is. So we created exactly a similar kind of tool where, um, where the parent and the youth are always connected and tethered um, by a pairing of these apps that are connected to a server where the parent can find the kid at any time. The kid gets to you know, track the points for engaging in effective behaviors over the course of time. Parent gets notifications. Did I already... Um, the kid has a super clear schedule. Think about the, the mind of a developing youth, right? Like, not exactly a ton of prefrontal cortex or executive functioning. So they can look at the app and see exactly where they're supposed to be. Um, when, they're, when they do what they're supposed to do and they're on track, they get points. Um, so, and the other thing that I just have to say I think was really cool is that we also had these on-demand videos for parents that really addressed some of the higher, more problematic, difficult moments with your kid to teach them in real time how to actually intervene. Um, so staying, you know, setting firm limit, limits, um, calming down after a stressful interaction, et cetera. Um, so just in the, for the sake of time, what was shocking is that people actually, the youth reported higher outcomes of satisfaction than the parents, interestingly. And what the youth said oftentimes in reporting why they love the app is they said, because I actually feel like now, A, my parent is paying more attention to the positive things that I do than just all the negative things that I do. And the other is because now I have proof I have proof that I did what I said I was going to do. They can just look at the record. They can look at the log. All right, so just some other really cool things that are happening um, in our field right now. So this is just where, you know, skin apps, this is one for people who are getting off of um, smoking. And this is detecting um, nicotine levels in the system. And, as, and it's giving the person on their phone little messages, like it's saying things like, look, I'm feeling better all the time. My lungs are able to breathe more comfortably, right? <clears throat> and then here's just an example of you know, different patches that are connected um, where you can see um, the respiration level, the temperature of your kid. I mean, it's sort of endless when you think about the way, so going back to that whole coaching you know, imagine having a skin patch where the thing is picking up um, degrees of distress, right? And it's before you're even in a location, it's prompting you to do certain activities like breathing, deep breathing. So here's, um, I just think, a fascinating thing of um, this is, I believe it was in Uganda, where investigators developed this little antenna pill to help um, determine um, adherence and monitoring of um, HIV medication, antiretroviral uh, medication. So here they are, I believe they were somewhere in the East Coast, but monitoring in Uganda what people were doing with their medications. You know, the transfer here, obviously, with, you know, eldering, elderly parents, are they taking their medications as prescribed? Could they be helped by a phone app? So what if we use virtual humans? Could they help solve this problem? So this is research by Brian Jack and his colleagues at Boston University. 
This is stunningly wonderful and with remarkable results. So you probably know that the problem um, in hospitals, many hospitals, is this problem of of people being readmitted, right, um, after discharge. Now, it's, I didn't realize this until recently, but the problem with readmission is that you get penalized, right? By So there is a big incentive for hospitals to figure out how to make sure that patients, when they're discharged, are discharged well. So what Brian Jack did is he said, look, let's figure out, and it's one in five, are readmitted in the, um, nurse in the, the first 30 days. So he was wondering, can we create Nurse Louise, this awesome avatar that emulates face-to-face communication, develops therapeutic alliance, um, and can actually teach the patient, do what's needed to ensure this patient has exactly the instructions that are needed um, to discharge well from the hospital. So... In fact, hospital readmittance rates were cut in half, but interestingly, patients loved Louise, and they said things. I mean, and and you know, Louise is not fancy. They said things like, you know, why did you enjoy working with Nurse Louise? And they said because we felt cared about, because we got what we needed from Nurse Louise. You know, she was always there for us, um, and she knew she had information that was helpful. So not only did it cut it in half, it obviously saved um, money to the system. So we began wondering, um, and, and, and this is actually, you can go to this website if you want, Cogito. There's a lab at USC in Southern California that's doing amazing, amazing work um, with avatars, where avatars are um, beginning to develop portions of therapy. And what the avatar is actually doing is reading the facial expressions um, using Ek- Paul Ekman's facial coding, um, attending um, to the body language and to the tone of voice. Um, and you can actually you know, watch this whole thing. But in the interest of time, we're going to continue. But she, her, her, um, her expressions are being completely um, um, in response to the patient and what he communicates and how he communicates it. So this is not, I mean, these guys... They're a ways away from being um, from having an avatar that really does therapy fully and completely, but certainly they're on track. So we were wondering, could we take an avatar? And this is actually an idea that we had um, in collaboration with Kate Comtois, who's a DBT expert and also a suicidologist, who does a lot of work with David Jobes um, and CAMS, the Collaborative Assessment and Management with Suicidality. And what we wondered was, would it be possible to construct an avatar that you could actually have um, for use in emergency departments um, so that when a patient is suicidal, they come in and they're just sitting around waiting. They actually meet with good old Dr. Dave. Um, and Dr. Dave, as an avatar, performing the collaborative assessment and management of suicidality. And through that assessment and working with an avatar, that they would actually... Um, what would they, a lot of information would get gathered by Dr. Dave, the avatar, and the, and, the, um, and the patient, and it would get recorded in a way that would get transmitted to the ED attending or whoever the person is that they meet with next. Um, so this is the project now funded by uh, NIMH that we're currently working on. Now, this one is also fascinating to me from just a usability perspective. Um, a lot of people ask the question, you know, is it better to have videos or an avatar? You know, do you really need an avatar versus a video? Um, do you want to have a real voice or a computerized voice? So here is, based on not a ton of data so far, but data from inpatient suicidal patients, and we'll be, collect, we'll be validating this with, soon with patients in the ED, it is, it's looking like this that for the broadest spectrum of people who are suicidal who come into an emergency department and end up in the inpatient, they actually prefer an avatar. Why? Because it's clear to them, and this is for people who are more psychotic, right, that this is not, that this is just an avatar, not a real person who's trying to get in my head. They prefer computer voice versus a real voice because it's not, I know it's a computer voice. It sounds like a computer voice, and it's not, I, this is their words, is I know it's not trying to get in my head. So, you know, it's just interesting, again, from a design perspective, why this would be so important. 
Um, so our hope, too, is that this, by doing the avatar, um, is part of the first thing that happens, um, that they will um, begin to better able, um, they'll be more prepared to tell their story to the emergency room doc, you know, so they'll be more efficient, they'll be able and more precise about what it is that they need. Um, rather than getting more emotionally dysregulated while waiting and then have, getting bumped because there's higher order psychiatric emergencies that come into the ED, they actually learn skills and they're using those skills. But here's the other really awesome potential, which is that when they leave the emergency department, um, they'll get what's called a caring contact. There's a ton of data that shows, not a ton, but a fair amount of data, that if you want to, it's as a brief intervention to reduce the risk of suicide. If you have a little note that comes from the doc or from someone in the emergency department a month later, three months later, saying, I'm thinking about you, that that actually will significantly decrease the risk of suicide. So is it possible then that um, Dr. Dave could be part of the sending of those caring contacts and that at least at a minimum is automated? And maybe what we'll find at the end of the day is that a client prefers the message to come from themselves, saying, listen, this is what I want you to remember. But the point is, is that the system can continue to travel with the patient after their visit in the emergency department. So just really quickly, um, the thing that I think we're all really excited about is it changing the brain in ways that have nothing to do with th therapy, um, but that are brain drills. Um, so um, interesting study by um, Amir at the um, University of um, uh, California at San Diego. What he found is this attention modification program um, was as effective as um, a, a um, cognitive behavioral therapy doing face-to-face -face for GAD. Isn't that interesting? So I can do on my own a little attention modification and have as good of outcomes as face-to-face -face therapy doing an evidence-based practice. Um, of course, we have Sophia's fabulous work um, moving the field in the direction of computerized cognitive training, which, you know, in my, um, I think our, I think we all feel very hopeful that this is a direction not only for schizophrenics, but for other populations as well, that there may be ways in which we can target very specific areas of the brain with brain drills or activities that actually improve their functioning. Um, several years ago, Jane McGonigal published this provocative book. We spend three billion hours a week playing online games. Can you believe that? Three billion hours. Five million gamers worldwide spend one hour um, plus weekly playing online games. And average kids will spend 10,000 hours, 10,000 hours, enough to become an expert, um, gaming before they turn 21, right? So her whole point was, oh, here, these are just spatial expressions of people on the verge of an epic win playing these computer games. Um, so the question is, can we actually then create software? Um, can we create programs that change the brain, um, that are fun and engaging and rewarding? So that Villageware grant, the um, grant that we're doing with Scott Hingler, the MST grant, creating the mobile app, we actually have um, a top game designer from San Francisco who will be working with us to figure out, can we further optimize that app for youth where they actually really, really, really love engaging in functional behaviors because it's fun. So that's our goal. All right. Yeah. Are we done? Am I done? Yes. This is where we switch to you? Switch. This switch. is like worldwide wrestling. <laughs> I leap off the side. You guys probably don't watch World Wide Wrestling. Like. <laughs> if you, I don't know how you feel, but when you see all that, you start to just get excited. You know, like, okay, where do I start? Okay, which app should I download? What should I integrate? What should our system, you know, it's, it starts to be, um, at least for me, it starts to be a repetition of the problem that Linda mentioned with all of those treatments that work manuals. It's like, oh, okay, now we have five billion apps and we have a zillion ways we can integrate this. So for us, the, the direction that we're moving ourselves now is, wait a second here, we do not want to keep on with this problem of too much proliferation, too many things for the average therapist or patient to actually make sense of. So how can you bring this into one place that helps you make these sorts of decisions and that in some ways... Um, would end up where you had a way to assess 
all of the problems. You had a way to do shared decision making. So together you would look at the whole person and decide what should you prioritize. That had self-help integrated, that had ways to train therapists integrated, but some way to put a wrapper on this so that it's all in one place and you don't have a bunch of now new sites, like 30 apps on your phone, 30 places that there's therapists you have to go. So <clears throat> the other important thing is, and there's a way to flip this training as usual paradigm so that in fact you learn by doing, you don't go off to do the expensive training, but in fact you can just do it in your office. You have a patient cancel, you learn a new treatment while you're there. You have five minutes to prep, you learn the one new thing from that two day, do you guys go to trainings where you think, I could have, if I could have got that 15 minutes, that was all I needed, I know all the other stuff. Some, some way to make it be where it's very efficient for an experienced therapist to pick up just the bit they need, or a novice person to do it, but not where it's talking, but more where it's this performance-based, where in fact you're, you're learning it because you're about to go do it, sort of a model. And uh, where you can, where appropriate, have an expert there. You know how patients will listen to an expert where you've said the same thing for the last 10 sessions, but then they saw it on YouTube? It's like, oh, <laughs> I want to do that thing now. Uh, you know, is there some way for us to bring actual videos of the most expert therapists into the room so either you play that video with your patient or you watch it and you emulate it? Like you, you know, you see how they deliver that rationale and you make it your own so that there's a, it's a training or a thing with your patient. With this idea, the dissemination model has been researchers tell practitioners what to do. And what our lived experience is, is that there is so much innovation happening in practice that is not discovered. And when you set up certain types of progress monitoring that is done by therapists out in the universe, you see the cool positive deviants is what they're called. The people who stand out because they are getting way better outcomes even than is happening in clinical trials. So there's a way to design a sort of a bigger system where Important science happens, it drops into your system, everybody has it the next day, so to speak, but also where when practitioners make important uh, discoveries, it pipes back into the research agenda, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's a round trick, it's not this one way, top down sort of a model, uh, it, at least as we've been thinking about how could we move this way so that the patient actually receives the best care whether that's an evidence-based treatment or it's the improvisation in a disciplined progress monitoring way of a local clinician. So this, I will just spend a couple minutes, this is probably the coolest project that Linda and I in our, in our increasingly elderly days <laughs> are gonna get to work on. You know, this is kind of the, the bringing together of the work that we've done over these last 20, 25 years. Where when you think of these silos, is there a way to come in and with a little uh, bulldozer here, get rid of that way of thinking, you know, and instead move to something where you pull all of the evidence-based procedures from the different sort of silos into something that's a more organic organization of the information so that both the patient and the doc or the practitioner can think about the person as a whole. They have depression, they struggle with alcohol, there's interpersonal violence, and their health problems. And how do those all combine? And what should you prioritize? So that the expertness of the local clinician can prioritize and draw and tailor the, uh, in a very precise way what's needed. So that's, that's the way we've been thinking about it. I'll just tell you kind of, um, you see these are hand-drawn diagrams. Uh, partly that's because there's a craftsmanship still. Like it's not just a science that we're all engaged in. There is an art to it. And the, the way in which the expert, the local expert, the patient and practitioner sitting together have to make decisions together about what is the next step. So, but the tools that we are trying to bring into a platform include self-assessments up at the top, online self-help, Guided self-help, so you assign an app, the person does it, you see the reports all reported via the progress monitoring, and both you and the, th and the patient get notifications about change 
And is that a reliable change? And what's the trajectory like? And what led, like right now I have a, a patient who is, um, uh, struggles with bipolar disorder and she wants to get pregnant. So she's come off her medications in order to start to get pregnant. And I'm just seeing her periodically. She's doing fantastic. But I can monitor. She can fill out a self-assessment. I can monitor that. And I can tell, is that score going up or down? And because we've tracked it well, we know what her early warning signs are. So this sort of system lets me uh, monitor progress, make decisions together, and also learn the therapy. So I'll just, um, you know, we said we're really interested in scaling. If you have a lot of this computerized so it actually fits your workflow as a clinician, then you can roll it out across a whole system so that more and more folks can come in. So I'll just say a little bit about this. It's got progress monitoring. It has a supervisor dashboard, so you can triage. You can see all of the patients that are on your therapist's load for reliable change for suicidality, so you can just see at a glance who actually should you be taking care of or prioritizing for supervision. There's a fair amount of decision support, so if they have this marker and that marker, consider this while it's still at your discretion in terms of how you choose which treatments to use. I'll show you the just-in-time training because that, at least for me as a person who's a lot of training of therapists, is a nice feature. Um, and then, it, as Linda mentioned, there's computer-assisted therapy, and there's also some of the diary cards. So like in, for those of you who might do dialectical behavior therapy, there's a diary card for DBT in here. So just a few screenshots of this so you can kind of see um, where, oh, and I would just say program evaluation. The ability to look and aggregate data across patients and across therapists to see how you are doing. So um, let me just show you real quick the, a few screenshots. So, when you set up a patient in Willow, you can check off what problems they have. Then Willow will su suggest to you what protocols, what's an evidence-based protocol given those problems. Whoops, sorry. But also suggest to you measures. So the patient, uh, you select what they are, how often you want to give them, when the person should start. But then the patient can fill out the measures on their phone or on their computer, and that data is immediately available to you. That, does that make sense? So most of us were never trained in what measures are actually the right ones to give. So we just, we sort of make it easy. There's a, there's a some we will suggest to you based on what's the best one based on evidence. But there's a big library in case there are other measures that matter to you. Does that make sense? So you, you, we suggest, but you can pick from a large library. And then the data are actually summarized for you graphically. A lot of this, I'll just uh, highlight for you a couple of things. Um, the color coding, red, uh, orange, and yellow, s indicates severity. Blue means not severe. And so you can at a glance sort of see this and review the data weekly with your patient for any of your primary problems that you're uh, working on. And the other, I just want to highlight this little annotation here. This lets you put notes. So this is what my... Um, client who has bipolar disorder and I are using, we've tracked what's happened as she's tapered her meds. We've tracked the past incidences. So now with her, I have um, six months of data. We can look very quickly and remember why were these different symptom changes happening and have a real discussion about whether or not she should discontinue on her own versus discuss it with her physician first, stuff like that. So it's, it's actually super fun. And then what I'll show you, does that, this is making sense, yeah? I wish I could do an online demo, but we weren't sure if we'd have uh, internet in here. The last part I'll just show you is the built-in ways of doing just-in-time training. So this example patient is for depression. And so we're using a treatment called behavioral activation. And what we've done in this tool is we've taken an evidence-based protocol broken it into the therapy tasks, in other words, the exact things you would do as you're delivering that treatment. And so on the left, you see the list of all the possible things you do in that protocol. In the right is the evidence-based session-by-session agenda, if you took these tasks and had them laid out session-by-session. Session. Now, most of you guys will have to modify how you deliver a treatment, right? They might not have just depression. They also have insomnia. So you'd be bringing in, and, and what this lets you do is click and drag, delete, and tailor so that you have the ability to make the session fit your person. Does that make sense? 
And I'll tell you the thing that's most satisfying to me is this click and drag. Like you can order it and then it shows up on your agenda. So I can set up my treatment plan at the beginning of a case and then just it's all laid out for me. So I march through it. And then when I don't know how to do something, so let's say there's a create activity hierarchy here. If you were to expand that, built into the tool at the task level is training how to do that. So this is how you would create an activity hierarchy in, in behavioral activation. And if you expand it, whoops, sorry, let me go here. You can see the like bullet points. If you already know how to do the treatment, it's just like a little checklist reminder of how to do it. But if you're new, there's a video of an expert demonstrating how to do that therapy task. So you could quickly learn a new treatment, like in the few minutes you have before. It's sort of like um, how most of us have. You know, like you read that part of the manual right before you go in and have to do it. Except this is all organized for you, okay? So you train, and then this will be integrated um, in our next iteration with continuing education credit, so you can actually get credit for learning the tasks. Um, I'll just say one last thing. This um, Atul Gawande is one of my heroes, and so as I've been thinking myself about how to think about this, there's a short set of modular competencies I think all therapists should have. The ability to monitor progress, assess and manage suicide, do some version of behavioral activation, assist with trauma, and then these two protocols, insomnia and bipolar, are super useful. And if we all had this to an expert level, I think we would kick ass on our outcomes. <laughs> so this, this is where we've prioritized the protocols that are in this tool that we're working on. And, I'll, and this is my last comment. So um, a tool like this lets you do what's called citizen science. There's this guy, Chris Lintot, now we're finally to the astrophysicist that I mentioned at the beginning. He and a colleague, it turns out astrophysicists have a really hard time coding galaxies. They cannot get a um, computerized version to recognize whether it's a left-turning spiral arm or a right-turning spiral arm. Only humans can really detect the pattern. So, And they have unbelievable data coming from the Hubble Space Telescope. And they said, well, what if we, what if we had all these amateurs actually able to help us do science? And what they did over, uh, genuinely, it was over a, a pint in the Oxford pub, is they dreamed up how they could get people to code galaxies. And you could actually code these galaxies yourself at the Galaxy Zoo. I highly recommend it. It's super fun. They have a set of calibration things, and you code, and you get corrective feedback. Is this a left or right? You identify the galaxy. And, uh, and they have now expanded where there's a hundred, uh, there's uh, probably bigger than this now, but a half a million volunteers are sorting these galaxies for them, Right? It, it makes the endeavor of science possible when you have that. And so that's the direction we are moving with um, our own work, is this idea that you could, through a distributed network of therapists, all using progress monitoring in the tool that we were just mentioning, you would, through camaraderie, set up the questions that matter to you and each roll them out so that we could generate I call it warm data, not you know, kind of that cold, distant research. It's our data, like we made it. We and our patients made it. And that this can inform how we deliver care. But with a system like what we're, what we're trying to build right now and why I think we're both so excited about it is that it actually allows us to have instantaneous, like you discover something, we all know it the next day because we're using a similar uh, protocol. So this is, this is the direction we're going where there's a big data approach that can start to pipe in in a very precise way. Here's the interventions that lead most efficiently to change. We all replicate it, and then we have all got that protocol because you can just drop it right into that little protocol thing I showed you a second ago. We can get down to the therapy. Like if we're doing exposure therapy, it's really helpful if you do it in this particular way. And then we all have the refinement. So that is where we are at. Um, just to thank uh, NIMH again here, they've believed in our sort of line of thinking for years and funded us very generously. It wouldn't have been possible without them. And uh, move to questions uh, that you guys have. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, shall we take a few questions? Yes, please. Yeah, so I'll repeat that question. For the CCBT data, 
Did you did that have anything about age, education, income, any things like that? You know, I don't know. I bet that data exists, and I don't know it. So are so are people who are older less able to get the benefits out of CCBT? I'm sure that data exists. I don't know that data, um, but I, I can say that the um, you know the problem of why the problem with the self help is just it's a motivation getting the person to do it. And what in guided what happens is that you know the person it's it's a little bit like the way they do it in the UK is the person still comes to the clinic they're met by a person um, or it's over the phone. But they say, okay, so today we're going to do module X, and this is what you're going to cover. And then, um, and by the way, did you do the homework? Any questions from last week's homework? Okay, no, great. Right, you're on your own. And then the person will do the module. They'll come back in for the last five minutes and say, any questions about what you've got there? You know, and then they can answer those questions. Um, and it's really, it ends up being, you know, max a 10-minute intervention on the part of the clinician or the nurse. Yeah. 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 Let's let um, that one. I would say neither of us. We'd have to go through the studies with you because I can't answer that right off the bat. But if you want to come up and we can exchange emails, I'd be glad to get you that data. Because I think yeah, that the broader thing, just to raise it up, is that in fact you do have to tailor. And one of the things for us, um, both very interested in equity of access. If you look at underserved populations, especially when SES and reading and all the rest, all of the design things here are meant so that um, you do not have to have a phone yourself as a patient, and you don't have to be able to read. Your therapist could actually walk through with you, much like what Linda was just describing, so that there's a way to overcome those barriers and just have that more mediated by another person. So, but I understand your, yeah, sure. Health innovations. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Michelle. Um, there was a on my right hand side was an icon of a person, and then there were arrows um, indicating the various um, sensory inputs that were being targeted. And there two of them appeared to be visceral, but I couldn't read the details underneath those. Okay. So if you have a chance to put back up that slide, maybe sure. I can come up and read it. Later. Okay. Perfect. Right, yeah, we can you. come back to Afterwards, that. Afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Sure. Happy to. Thank you. Yeah. How did you decide what self assessment? Well, what we went for were as many of the main constructs, kind of like um, distribution. If you think of what are the most frequently occurring problems and what is the construct that is relevant to that, and then what are the public domain measures that are available for that, and where are the ones um, where you don't have to pay a fee. So it's kind of like a little bit of a triage. So we, we're trying to get the broadest coverage for the main problems first amongst um, people who are similarly minded, who are, we, we want to not have this cost go up per, per assessment. So that was the rationale. And they're yeah. all scientifically validated, obviously. And now we're working also on ways to, um, even for those measures that are not in the public domain, working out deals with the, um, the folks who've developed the measures to um, hopefully allow us to make use of their measure by them having access to the data repository that will be part of Willow. So that the more, um, so in exchange for the use of their measure, they also will have access to tons yeah. of data in their own research. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. Very well. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, one of the things we struggle with in our uh, ecological momentary assessment, um, cell phone based, uh, both clinically and from the perspective of the IRB is issues around safety. Client, uh, can you talk a little bit about suicide risk and how you've built that in within your system? Yeah, so um, are, is, are your, this may be a little bit more like getting into the details, so it could be we continue outside, but just in terms of your, is, is yours a completely self-help app? I mean, or a self-help, do they have any access in the EMA to the clinician? 
Uh, within our EMI study, they do, yeah. but within our EMA studies that they are don't. not treatment-based. Okay. Yeah. So the way that we're, I mean, all of the stuff that we've done so far has access to a clinician. So we've not run head into that wall yet. The way that we've planned to handle it is we have, um, there's a guy, David Jobes, who you saw, Dr. Dave up there. Um, we've just been working very closely with suicidologists. There's a lot of ways where research communities are exclude people who have suicide um, as a problem because they get scared of the risks involved, and it means that treatments aren't developed for them. So often it's a longer-term process of educating your IRB about why the potential gains for you to have that and to have an adequate way in which you can route those people to appropriate care is worth it in the long haul rather than excluding those people. So that's, it's the same as, you know, like with pregnant women often get screened out of important research trials because they're pregnant. And so we, we've taken more of the approach of how do you bring the relative expertise to your IRB to educate them and to get them to expand uh, and address their concerns. Is that okay? You know, just to add to, you guys may have already done this, but um, Jane Pearson at NIMH will be a great resource also on the yeah. suicide question because we struggle with this. And now I just have my hat on as a grant reviewer and also just as a member of our own IRB. You know, um, having disclaimers where people understand, like, there's no one who's going to get this information. Um, and then the other thing, just this is, it's different than suicide, but um, um, with our MST study where people are, you know, saying that they're doing illegal behaviors, right? So we teach them about how to protect their phones. Like, we really, really encourage that everyone has a password protection on their phone so that if they are stopped, pulled over by police, person that you actually by law can't require a person to unlock and open their phone. Um, so we do things like that. And then the final thing, I just, we had a, um, um, our DSMB meeting with, um, for Willow not too long ago. And one of the persons, we, I was asking about a similar IRB issue, and she said, you know, there's this concept that her DSMB talked about. DSMB is Data Safety Monitoring Board, um, called a protective study. And I thought that's so interesting. Because a protective study, you know, you right away differentiate it from being a study where you're trying a new, you're testing a new intervention that really has no, you know, it, there's no reason to believe that the intervention is actually going to be helpful. It could be iatrogenic, whether it's a medication or something else. So when you think about it that way, then from a risk management perspective, it's a very different, does that make sense? A yeah. protective study. Yeah. There was another comment or question? Yeah. Um, I think the... Obviously, your app is like the coolest thing ever. And um, one thought I was wondering, I don't know if y'all have gotten to this point yet, but how are you envisioning in terms of like um, kind of disseminating it out? Like, is it going to be a cost per month, a subscription? Like, would it be available in private practices or just yeah. in larger institutions? And oh my I don't gosh. know if you know Have that, you not but... thought about that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair. If I take her, yeah. So I would... I would say the, um, so the NIH is very concerned that organizations they fund are able to commercialize so that it doesn't just get developed and sit on the shelf someplace. So it's very much part of how we're thinking. The, the model that we've, we're, we're rolling it out and we're rolling it out first with people who are um, really already believers in evidence-based care. Uh, and so we have a small cohort actually right now who are some private practice and some sort of clinics who are in with us at the early stages, um, which is super helpful. So if you're actually, I would just say, if you want to come up and get a card, I'm glad to tell you about that if you're interested. But the, but the spirit of what we're trying to do is go for larger healthcare systems where, in fact, it could be a broader health impact. Like that's actually where we're targeting most. And, um, and so, I mean, this is, I'll just, just because we tend to be pretty transparent, I would just say the way I'm thinking about private practice folk who aren't part of a big system is that there's a way to join into this practice research network, into that big collaborative thing, so that in fact there's a group of us who are creating data so that practice is actually starting to inform research more. My sort of bottom-up populist self is very interested in uh, that flow of information. So, And where the primary market will end up being, yeah. you know, um, really big systems that will benefit from value-based care. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I think this is wonderful work that you're doing at clinicians who are already out in the community and practicing. And I'm wondering if you're thinking about 
how to apply it to people who are in training, because we know even at a lot of programs, people aren't being well trained in evidence-based practice. And can uh, <laughs> we implement this on the front end? Sure, sure. Do you want to take that on or do we? Yeah. Okay. So the so that I don't know if you saw the with the one place where the protocols are breaking broken out, it's designed so that actually if you're a novice, you can learn something. So like I didn't know CBT for insomnia before we started this project. But when you break it out like that, and then you have an expert actually demonstrate all those components, then you learn it. And so it is, it is structured that way. The ability to, especially like within a psychiatry residency um, training versus maybe clinical psychology versus uh, most MSW programs and um, MFT programs, you know, everybody's exposed to very different levels. And often the uh, I didn't ask who are faculty, so I'll just say this because I know you guys are on the side of the good. But often the faculty at different places aren't that invested in training evidence-based protocols. And so you can't get it, but the students are. And so if this was available, then a student can go and do their own self-guided study. You know, they do have a patient who needs X, Y, and Z. Nobody expert on the faculty teaches that, and they just start it. So that's that's a lot of how we are thinking. Um, we would yeah. love it, you know, and just staying focused. Um, you know, we know, um, again, with the Affordable Care Act, with value-based care, thinking of everything moving more to a primary care context, having a big public health yeah. impact, we know we've got to figure out a way to um, do some of these other elements. So our focus is really going to be you know, moving from, continuing to expand what we're doing and then developing those self-help modules that really can stand um, on their own. And there's a lot of, I mean, we, we were contacted by an organization that does um, phone therapy as a, you know, and they're interested in knowing can they use Willow to help enable their clinicians to do phone therapy. They're clinicians who oftentimes don't, you know, they're BA yeah. level people. Yeah. Um, so there's, I think, potentially a lot of applications. Yeah, great question. Any other thoughts or comments or? Yeah. Thanks so much, yeah. everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. You have been 